usually is in the middle of a tectonic plate, not at those margins where we showed you before. Now, why is all this relevant? Well, as I said, if you take that journey along the Stewart Highway, whether it's in a car or whether you take the GAN, basically, and you, you journey up, you hit Heavy Tree Gap, which is the spectacular entrance um, to Alice Springs. If you're journeying on the train or you're, you're driving the car through there, it's a really spectacular entrance. Um, and what greets you, of course, are these quartzite units. So they're, they're basically a, a, a sandstone that's been cooked up a little bit and turned into a quartzite, and they're standing on their end. But of course, they, when they were deposited as sedimentary rocks, they would have been horizontal. But they're now vertical, or almost vertical, because of that deformation. So that's the first hint when you enter Alice that there's something going on. Okay, that there's a fair amount of deformation that at once had affected all of that region through there to go from something that was originally horizontal to now being almost vertical. And of course, it stretches all the way through there. It's a really spectacular way to um, introduce yourself to the heart of Central Australia. And then when you look in a little bit more detail, if you get on Google Earth, do yourself a favour and check it out because there are some spectacular um, formations that you can see for yourself if you just journey a little bit through the Western McDonnell Ranges as you can see through there. All of these structures, these folds and beautiful patterns you can see etched in the rock are the consequence of that deformation that's happened in Central Australia. Most of it stretching back about 600 million years and even further in some cases. So that's a time... Um, if we go back that far, when Central Australia was really quite active tectonically. We had these very large um, mountain systems developing right in the heart of Australia. And why is that relevant to this whole idea of gravity? <coughs> well, this is a map here of gravity anomalies across the Australian continent. Okay, so if you, again, cast your eye at the scale that you can see through there, the colours in red are very significant changes in gravity and the stuff in, in blue is where, where gravity is fairly regular and normal, okay? Now, if you, if you look at all these uh, locations here where we've got these little white arrows and, and there's a little blow-up of that region that you can see through there, there are these very significant ridges in red that you can see through there. Um, one in the south, which is part of the Musgrove province that you'll see through there, and two in the north, which are part of what we call the Arunta region. Now, that's a kind of a geological terrain uh, that we identify. So there's three main structures that you can see through there where we've got a very unusual gravity signature, a, a giant anomaly. And that's actually caused by a very simple process. If you look at this, this is a cross section basically. If we go from south to north through there, um, we cross, that's basically our journey. If we took our car from the south to the north and drove along there, that's essentially our drive along the Stewart Highway. And we cross this section through here, which is this first gravity wall, and then if we continue to the north, we cross the next one, which is just here. That third one is just off the map, okay, so we don't see that on this cross section. But if you look at the cross section, what you see are there's these little wedges of darker coloured material that have popped up through there, okay, and if you look at what they're labelled as, they're actually part of the mantle, okay, so that layer of the deep earth that's much, much denser, denser than the crust that we have exposed at the surface. And essentially that's all that's happening. There is a, there's a, quite a significant chunk of mantle that's been displaced along these very, very deeply penetrating faults that you can see through there. And it's pushed up that wedge much, much closer to the surface. And the consequence is we've got much, much denser rock that's very, very close to the surface and is reflected in that gravity signal. It's basically just a, a big blip on the gravity signal where that chunk of mantle is much closer to the, to the Earth. And that's what it looks like. It genuinely is a subterranean mountain range. So if you're following that traverse along through here, suddenly the gravity just goes up, steps up like that, along that first um, wedge of mantle that you can see through there to the south. And if you do the journey again, there's another blip right through there. It genuinely is a very significant kind of mountain range that's hidden beneath the surface at about uh, 20 or 30 kilometres down. And that's along these faults, displacement of the mantle by about that amount, by about 20 to 30 kilometres. So that material has moved quite a significant distance along that structure there to reduce <coughs> that gravity uh, anomaly that you can see there. What does it mean in effect? I guess it means if you're wanting, if you're going to drop a stone on your foot, you're better to do it over here than you are to do it here. It's going to hurt just a tiny <laughs> little bit less. It's obviously not going to be perceptible, um, but still, if, if you wanted to minimise damage, definitely do it on the southern part. Um, of the border rather than when you get to Alice Springs and near there, okay, which is where all these features occur. 
Now, what do these things actually look like when they're on the surface? Well, they're quite picturesque, but you'd never know. That's the whole point. So the Woodruff thrust is this one to the south, that first gravity warp that we saw. And this is a photo I took when I did some field work out there. And that's about it. That's all you see. It's a very no, like picturesque, for sure, especially at sunset. But that's about the only outcrop you see. It's a very gentle um, uh, sort of series of low hills that outcrop through there. We only really see it when we look deep beneath the surface. There are sections in southern Australia near Mount Woodruff, which is where that, that name comes from, and you can see this in a bit more, uh, bit more exposure. Um, but out to the west, you'd never know. Okay, you're just journeying along, and that's about the only hill you sort of get any indication from. So that's this one here to the south in the Musgraves. But if we journey a little further north um, to the Arunta, which is along this thing called the Red Bank Shear Zone, uh, which is the greater of the two anomalies, actually, it's a little bit more spectacular, actually. Ormus and Gorge, has anyone been to Ormus and Gorge? Many of you probably have. It's a spectacular part of the Northern Territory, if you ever get to be there. So this is a photo, we've we taken our students there uh, when I was at Adelaide Uni doing some geological mapping. Um, and it's a great place to study geology. It's got beautiful exposure, <laughs> but it also sits right at the heart of that gravity anomaly, basically. So the cliffs that you can see there along the gorge, which are about 300 metres high, um, they are literally the extension of that major fault that runs down along the Red Bank Shear Zone, which I pointed out earlier. So all of these little cliffs that you can see through there, those sheets of quartzite that you can see there, they have been stacked one on top of the other on top of the other by that activity along that fault plane. And if you cast your eye down the gorge, as you can see through there, you can actually sh see those sheets. They are the sheets of quartzite that have been pushed along that giant fault structure which if you follow, this is essentially the surface expression of that structure which projects 50 kilometres down into the subsurface where that chunk of mantle has been displaced um, along that fault zone. So we get a little bit more of a hint <laughs> that something, something is uh, quite significant is going on in the subsurface uh, when we journey along uh, Ormiston Gorge, as you can see there. So that's the gravity wall. Anyway, our uh, next... Um, weird and wonderful thing uh, in terms of the geological history of Australia that we're going to touch on is a crater of cataclysmic proportions. And it's something that's actually been in the news a little bit recently, actually. This was a, an article in the conversation quite recently. We had a few near misses. We had a few um, asteroids that kind of uh, came a little bit too close for comfort, I guess, uh, in, 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 in the very recent past. And this article is all about um, what you can see on this map, essentially, which is a large number of, of ancient uh, meteorite impacts which have affected Australia. And there's a lot of them, okay? We're really pockmarked, um, if you know where to look, in terms of ancient um, uh, meteorite impacts that occur all the way across Australia. It's not just confined to one particular place. There's lots of them everywhere. But there's one special one in South Australia, which we'll get to in a little bit. So some of them are really obvious. Does anyone know what that one is? Wolf Creek, of course. <laughs> So that's the one everyone knows, I guess, for, for, um, for some reasons uh, that, that are difficult to explain sometimes to your to students. <laughs> um, but uh, that's an example, I guess, of a very obvious uh, meteorite impact that we have in WA uh, that, that has a very clear surface expression. It's very easy to identify. But in South Australia, of course, this is what one of the very significant meteorite impact structures look like. It's just a salt lake. Okay, so it's very hard to actually pick up this idea um, that there is, a, there is an impact crater there at all. Okay, and that particular salt lake is that one right there. Okay, which, which if I peel that off, is this sort of, so it kind of gives a little bit of a hint, I guess. It's a bit of a circular indent that you can see there, but nothing too much. But that is Lake Ackerman. Okay, and the Ackerman impact is the one that I'm going to be talking about. When you look at the, um, some of the subsurface imaging that we can produce, and this is the digital elevation model, basically a, a model which exaggerates the topographic difference between the base of, the, um, of Lake Ackerman and the Gawler Ranges which surround it, as you can see through there, that's when you start to get a bit of a hint, I guess, that there's something going on here, okay, because it has that quite obvious circular indentation, I guess. Uh, in the earth that you can see there. And that was probably the first hint that we had that there was something unusual going on that might be linked to a meteorite impact. But there are a few other clues that we can pick up at the site itself. So these things are called shatter cones. They're basically conical kind of features, very distinctive features uh, that we can observe in the rocks where the meteorite impacts 
uh, in, that, in that, you know, the right central part of that impact zone. And they're produced by very, very intense pressures, pressures that we don't get via normal processes that occur on the surface of the Earth. So when you identify features like this, you've got a bit of a hint that something must, must have happened to produce pressures that are just too, too extreme, too unusual to explain by many other mechanisms. But it wasn't only that. There are also these things called shock quartz grains, okay? And what we, you can see here, these features are, are effectively very, very fine planar fractures. When you look under the microscope at some quartz grains, you can see these, these series of intersecting sets of fractures, basically. Okay, and again, the same explanation. They're produced by very extreme pressures um, that cause these features to develop in, in these tiny little quartz grains that we can observe. So we start to get a bit of a hint that there's something going on. But of course, the, the impact of the meteorite wasn't just restricted to that initial blast zone. Okay, so we actually picked up some of the critical evidence that this was quite a significant event much, much further away. Okay, of course, I'm sure you all know where that is, okay, which is Bunyuri Gorge uh, in the Flinders Ranges. And that's actually where we found some of the critical evidence that tied a lot of these threads together. And it's a pretty interesting story, actually, um, because the two threads actually came together independently. There was a, a BHP geologist, George Williams, who was working in the Air Peninsula at Lake Ackerman, um, who identified the impact structure in many of the shock ports and shadow cones and various other things that I showed earlier. And there was another geologist, Vic Gostin, who actually taught me and, sh and, and actually showed me some of these structures in the Flinders um, himself when I was doing my undergraduate at, at the University of Adelaide. He identified what I'm going to show you next, um, which was the evidence of the fallout from that um, uh, meteorite impact. So the two of them were working independently, quite fortuitously at roughly the same time, and kind of through a meeting at dinner, <coughs> as I understand it, one of them knew where um, the impact zone was, we couldn't figure out where the, the fallout, or the ejector, as we call it, was. And the other one had found the ejector, but had no idea where the hole was. Okay, so the two of them basically put two and two together, and the story of Lake Ackerman was born. So that, that's serendipity, if, if I've ever seen it, I guess. Um, but what Vic found, essentially, is this, okay? A very distinctive horizon that occurs uh, in the Bunyaroo Formation, in the Flinders Ranges, which is a shale unit. So, this, this sort of grey coloured stone that you can see through there is, is what we call a shale. It's a deep water sedimentary rock that forms um, in a marine sort of environment. And as you're journeying through the Flinders, which again is a beautiful um, place to investigate um, the deep earth because it's basically got those uh, sedimentary rocks again tilted on their side and you can sort of, as you walk through Bunyuri Gorge and Bratchina Gorge, you're essentially walking your way through time because the rocks have been tilted on their end and you can essentially move downwards in time uh, um, as, you, as you journey in a, in a linear sort of pattern. <coughs> and so what we see when we look at this particular unit, this shale unit, is it's fairly consistent. It's this kind of grey coloured stone as you're doing that journey and you're walking along. And then suddenly there's this very sharp break and we get these, these very distinctive pink rock fragments that appear in the rock record. And they're aliens, effectively. That's what they are. They have no business being there. Okay, because they're derived from rocks which come from the Air Peninsula. Okay, they are pieces of Gawler Range volcanics, which I'll introduce a little bit later as well. Okay, so the, the Gawler Ranges themselves are made up of this very distinctive pink rock um, arrival, which you can see through there. And what Vic identified and put, and, 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 uh, put two and two together was, these things can't come from the Flinders. There's no logical local source for these chunks of rock. The only one that I know of that's anywhere near here must have been in the Gawler Ranges. And that's when they do the chemistry and they do some of the dating to figure out this, that's the connection that was made. That these clasts have come from about 300 kilometres away. Okay, and that the only mechanism feasibly to do that um, and produce some of the features you can see through there is of course a meteorite impact. Okay, so that's the origin of these very unusual alien sort of clasts that you can see embedded in that uh, unit that occurs in the Flinders Ranges. And it's not just there, there are a few others, but that's the kind of idea, basically, that we had this um, meteorite impact that had this kind of very wide-reaching effect. Things being deposited over, over 300 kilometres away, and some of the features being recorded not just in the Flinders, but actually in the officer basin, you can see there. There are other uh, records of this ejector layer, this horizon of unusual debris that came out of the um, impact being recorded um, through there, as you can see. So a very widespread event, not just restricted to 
the impact zone itself, but the fallout being much more widespread. And this is essentially, um, I guess, the anatomy of that impact, if you like. So it's, it's, it's quite old, 580 million years ago. Some of the energy involved, you know, uh, that we've got there, that should be 10 to the 6, sorry. Um, so several, uh, several millions of megaton megatons of TNT, so it's a big, it's a big one. Um, the crater itself, about 90 kilometres wide is what we think. And if you follow the true extent of that ejector blanket, we're over 500 kilometres. Okay, so a huge <laughs> amount of energy um, to, to cause the meteorite to impact and then blast all this material. It would have had a lot of other activity associated with it. Things like tsunamis um, and many other weather events that would have been caused by that, that real shock to the system caused by the Ackerman impact. So a very, very extreme event, geologically speaking. One of the best, one of the largest that we've got recorded anywhere on the globe. Okay, so number three is Earth's ancient supervolcano. And we know a little bit about um, supervolcanoes in the, in the modern day Earth, okay? Which is, of course, what well, you can see there at Yellowstone. Okay, that's our best example in the modern Earth of a, a very large um, supervolcano uh, that's, that's active today. Okay, and it's quite picturesque, but <laughs> it is a bit of a risk, I guess, if, if something decides to uh, get over the edge, I guess, we could, we could have some really extreme activity occurring right there if we ever uh, get to that point in the near future. Um, but that's our best analogue, I guess, in the modern day. But if you look at the ancient Earth, we've got a far bigger one, like a far, far bigger one, sitting right there in the Gaula Ranges. The origin of many of those clasts, which I just showed you, um, in the Flinders Ranges that, that were ejected by that impact. Okay, so that's, the, that's a, a typical image of the Gaula Ranges that you can see through there. And these rocks, these again, you notice the, the connection in terms of colour. They're very red. They've got that real pinky red sort of colour that's so distinctive. And it occurs all the way through the, um, uh, the Gaula Ranges themselves. They really do stick out in terms of their colour. And they're all basically the same rock unit. It's a very voluminous uh, rock which came almost instantaneously as part of a, a super volcano um, event that occurred uh, over a billion years old. Okay, so about 1600 million years ago actually was when it all happened. And they've got some very picturesque um, ways that they get expressed as well. So the organ pipes are part of that same rock unit in the Gaula Ranges, the thing we call the Gaula Range Volcanics. Okay, and these are these very spectacular organ pipes which are essentially lava flows, very, very significant lava flows which cool into these, these kind of beautiful hexagonal patterns to form the shapes that you can see there. Some of them are over 300 metres thick, just a single lava flow um, that's been oozing out of that um, fissure basically in the crust and producing the features you can see there. And they're, they're stacked, one on top of the other on top of the other. Um, the idea that we have at the moment is that, uh, I think in terms of total volume, of lava that was erupted from it, and we've got more than enough to fill um, Sydney Harbour about a million times over. So it's a colossal amount of lava <coughs> that was erupted over a very short period, maybe one or two million years, okay, which geologically is quite, it's the blink of a light an eye almost. Okay, so we have a huge volume of material oozing out of that. You can imagine that quantity of material just suddenly appearing at Yellowstone right now. You know, we'd, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, and we know how big it is by again looking into the subsurface. That's a really key thing that geologists have to do sometimes to get the scale of things. We saw that with the gravity wall. We have to see underneath the surface get it, to get an idea of the scales involved. So this is a magnetic intensity image. It shows us rocks that are a little bit more magnetic than the rocks surrounding them. Okay, and if you just sort of get your eye in a little bit with that image there, you can kind of see this little apron of rock which kind of spreads out like that. It's kind of like a, uh, almost like a, um, like in Hawaii, I guess, would be an analogue. If you imagine the surface of Hawaii now where all that lava is oozing out, it kind of just spreads out like a, like a front, basically, of a very slow moving material that's moving out like that. Um, a, 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 you know, a kind of a, a, a flood of lava that's spreading out and oozing out from the central zone. And that feature that you can identify there in the magnetic image is actually exactly that. It's a, it's a pool of lava which would have erupted from this fissure and spread itself out over, out over an area that's much bigger than Hawaii. If you look at the scale there, that's 50 kilometres. Okay, so the total, if we look at the total size of it, that area I showed you before was just down through here. But that's the total size of the volcanic system represented by the Gawler Range Volcanics. Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's almost 500 kilometres wide. 
So that's big. <laughs> that's quite large. Much bigger than Yellowstone, much bigger than what we see in Hawaii. Um, that's quite a significant chunk of area basically covered by that single volcanic system okay, that's oozed out of um, the area that you can see through there. And like I said, it happened almost instantaneously, geologically speaking, over a very, very short window, uh, the volume of material that you can see there. And of course, one of the related things is that it produced Olympic Dam. So the deposit that we find right in our own backyard at Roxby Downs, um, which is one of the biggest uh, resources in terms of uranium and copper and iron oxide and various other things, that was a consequence of this um, volcanic event, essentially. So we have these huge reserves of, of metals that we're now mining as a consequence of, the, of a super volcano. That's essentially why we have one of the richest deposits in the world sitting in our own backyard was because of this very extreme uh, volcanic event that happened uh, 1.6 billion years ago. So you can, you can thank geology really for a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the mining wealth, I guess, that we've got um, within this state. So we get to our fourth um, and final uh, site, which you can see through here, which is submarine canyons. Again, things that occur a little bit below the surface that you probably didn't know uh, were there unless someone pointed them out to you. Okay, and. When you think of canyons and significant ones across the globe, it, of course, the Grand Canyon is the one that comes to mind. Does anyone know how deep the Grand Canyon is? It's about a mile. It's about a mile, yes, very good. You're better than my students. Um, <laughs> so it's about a mile deep, okay? And that, that seems quite a bit, especially when you're on the air walk or whatever it's called there. You wouldn't want to get vertigo. It's a long way down, okay? But that's, that's about the thickness of material that's been eroded. Um, along that canyon there to be exposed and there's really spectacular outcrops you can have all through that area. So a mile seems like a lot, okay? And the Murray, on the other hand, seems much less spectacular. Um, where certainly in the, in the present day where it's, it's often a bit choked with sand, the mouth is often not active because of that. Uh, the Murray itself is obviously quite a, an impressive river system, but um, it doesn't seem like it could produce anything like the Grand Canyon, and certainly in its current state. But we know by virtue of a very famous South Australian geologist that you can see there, Reg Spring, um, he was, I guess, the, the man behind uh, one, of these, one of the most remarkable discoveries in South Australia. And you can see he made the advertiser um, in 1947. Um, what Reg was doing was working with the Royal Australian Navy to do a bunch of soundings along the southern Australian coast, near Kangaroo Island and various other places, because they were trying to uh, survey uh, the possibility of installing a port, as you can see there, and a bit of a harbour. That's the first uh, paragraph you can see there. They, they actually thought of Rowe as the location of this new harbour. So the Navy was doing a lot of soundings through that area to, I guess, assess the, vi the viability of installing a new harbour there. And Reg, being very industrious, took that opportunity to actually learn a little bit about the geology of the southern Australian coast, which we had no idea of up until that point. So he did a bunch of soundings through there, <coughs> and this is his paper that was published in Nature and, and in the Royal Society of South Australia Transactions, as you can see there, in 1948 and 1947. And what he discovered, he, he did a bunch of soundings all through here, and you can see the, the contours which mark the depth um, to the ocean floor, and they're very, very closely spaced all through here because of the edge of the continental shelf where it starts to very suddenly drop off, as you can see through there. And what he noticed is what we now can image very, very accurately, um, as you can see through there, are these canyons, uh, which sit just off the south coast of Kangaroo Island. And there's a whole series of Sprit Canyon, of course, named after him, and various others that you can see through there. In terms of their total height, they're about five kilometres. So that's more than twice as high as the Grand Canyon. They're about 80 kilometres wide at their largest as well. Okay, so they're very, very significant canyons. Okay, you wouldn't want to get lost there. <laughs> I guess you, you'd never find your way out. Okay? Um, but that, that literally sits uh, a few kilometres off the coast of Kangaroo Island. And if we trace them back, this is the remarkable thing, they are actually the ancestral termination of the Murray River. Okay? They were produced when sea levels were much lower and the, the, um, the shoreline was much further away from the coast as it is now. So if, call, if you can imagine that the coastline sitting somewhere out through here where the sea levels are much lower, we can actually trace these ancestral channels all the way back, as you can see through there, the mouth at Lake Alexandrina and ultimately back to the River Murray. So these things were carved. We probably don't think of the Murray as being quite as mighty as, 
as, the, as what produced the Grand Canyon, but it did, okay? It's produced um, these very, very deep, five kilometre high canyons that we can see exposed on the edge of southern Australia now, okay, as a consequence of many, many years of erosion. Yeah. Well, John, I thought the River Murray went out through Port Gordon before the and our lofty ranges up there. It's gone through many, yeah, it's gone through many different changes over time. And and and, and you've actually raised a good point. Uh, the Murray has been very uh, susceptible to tectonic activity over over its journey. So the Cadilla Fault, for example, in Victoria, that's that uh, produced that swamp basically on, on its uh, eastern margin, basically as a consequence of an earthquake. Uh, which popped up and created almost a, a land barrier that prevented the Murray from following its journey as it was and created that swamp that you can see there um, along that, that structure. So the Murray's actually been pretty dynamic over its time because it's, it's several million years old, of course, in response to these various tectonic activities um, and changes in sea level as well, which, of course, affect the, the flow of the river. Um, but yeah, that's, that's essentially the consequence that we can see there. If we trace these threads of the, um, of the channels back to where they, um, to where they exit, it's, it's effectively the result of the journey of the Murray um, many, many years back in time. And the beauty of it now is you don't need uh, the Royal Navy to help you or anything like that. You can just go to Google Earth <laughs> and you can see these things for yourself. Okay, so I, I, like I said, it's a great teaching tool. I do encourage you, fire up Google Earth, Take yourself to the Murray Canyons, take yourself to those spectacular folds in Central Australia, take yourself to the Gawler Ranges. Um, I'm mentioning all the South Australian sites, but anyway, they're the best ones in my opinion. Um, there's so much geology to check out for yourself there um, if you spend a bit of time looking around, and, and it gets quite addictive, so you get stuck in it. So that's the take home message. Is Australia the dawn continent? Not really. Um, I think it's very, very active, geologically speaking, if you stretch far enough back in time. Um, and there's, there's some really world-class examples of remarkable tectonic and geological activity if you just know where to look. So, thanks for listening.